today's class, I want to continue the discussion of institutions uh, and then um, connect it to the discussion of inequality, uh, of which we've already had a, a prior installment in my discussion of the relation between structural change and compensatory redistribution. So I intend to divide today's argument into three parts. First, I want to speak to the concept of cooperation, which is implicit in every part of the institutional program of political economy I've been discussing. Uh, uh, and then second, uh, I want to restate the earlier discussion about inequality. And finally, third, uh, address the issue of the social base, the social constituency of these alternatives we have been discussing. Now, I suggested that a progressive political economy today if it is to have decisive structural content, must address three crucial issues. The first is the relation of the vanguard of production to the rest of the production system. The second is the relation of labor to capital. And the third is the relation of finance to the real economy or to production. And with respect to each of those three great questions, I proposed uh, particular institutional innovations. Now, if we take these innovations as a whole and see them in relation to one another, they imply a certain general conception of the market order and its reconstruction and the regime of cooperation implied in it. And it's that general conception of what you might call the higher forms of cooperation that I now want to speak to explicitly. So the first assumption common to those particular programmatic ideas is that in the ways in which we cooperate with one another, our hands should be untied as much as possible. And in particular, they should not be tied by our prior membership in any ascriptive social group based on class or on race. The second common idea of these innovations is that we should be free to innovate in the institutional arrangements that define the market order. The conventional conception of economic rationality, of maximizing choice in economics, is maximizing choice within a framework, an institutional framework of production and exchange that we take for granted. But here in these proposals, that I've been discussing around these three axes that I just recalled. The idea is that we don't simply recombine the factors of production within an unchanged framework of production and exchange. We innovate as we go along in the nature of this framework, in the framework of production and exchange. We don't do it all at once, according to the binary idea of politics, that politics is either the revolutionary substitution of one indivisible system by another, or the reformist management of one of these systems. We do it by the only way in which real structural change, in fact, happens in history, in a form that is fragmentary, and therefore ambiguous in its consequences, 
but nevertheless capable of advancing, of being cumulative in a particular direction under a certain idea. The third characteristic of these higher forms of cooperation is that they generalize an idea exemplified by the contemporary practices under social liberalism, especially in Europe, in the Netherlands and in Scandinavia, so-called flex security. The safeguards against economic insecurity, like unemployment insurance, basic social rights, are universally portable and detached from the possession of any particular job. Uh, and in this way, we can hope to reconcile, in a higher measure, economic security and economic flexibility. But that principle is now generalized to the whole of the economic order. And thus, the idea that I describe metaphorically as the haven and the storm. The individual is secure in a haven of vitally protected interests and of safeguards against public and private oppression and of instruments for the affirmation of his power of agency, his power to act. But he is safeguarded in that <coughs> vital core of interests, safeguards, and capability assuring endowments so that he can act. And thus what is central is this dialectical relation, this reciprocal relation between the haven and the storm. The storm does not occur spontaneously as a result of the haven. The storm has to be arranged. And the economic part of those arrangements of the storm, the storm of innovation, is the subject of these institutional ideas that I've been discussing, that I discuss with respect to the knowledge economy and that I will discuss after the spring recess with respect to the relation of labor to capital and of finance to the real economy. Another characteristic of these higher forms of cooperation is that they suppose a radicalization of competition and experimentalism. Not just competition in the provision of products and services, but competition among different ways of organizing things. <coughs> Competition leads into experimentalism. Experimentalism is the generalized form of competition. There should be a, a fervorous inducement, an inducement to entrepreneurial fervor in the creation of varieties, not just of products and services, but of alternative arrangements, but then Retrospectively, the results of this heightened experimentalism and competition should be subject to rigorous competitive selection. Now, on the basis of all of these characteristics of the higher forms of cooperation, we can hope to achieve a moderation of the tension between cooperation and innovation. Every form of cooperation depends on innovation. Every form of innovation requires cooperation. But in the short term, there's always a tension between the imperative to innovate and the imperative to cooperate. And the reason for that is that any innovation, whether it's technological, conceptual, organizational, or institutional, arouses the concern that will have a divisive distributive impact that will benefit some groups and harm others. And what we want is a form of cooperation that is as hospitable as possible to innovation. To moderate the tension between innovation and cooperation 
given that we cannot overcome it completely. And one of the most important ways in which we can hope to moderate the tension between innovation and cooperation is that generalization of flex security that I described before. The safeguards of the individual are universal. They're rendered portable. They're not dependent on, the, on his tenure of any particular job. And at the same time, we have arrangements that arouse the level of experimental conflict and divergence in society. And finally, as an attribute of these higher forms of cooperation, this idea that goes back to the abstract conception of the market, we take it as one of our objectives to separate entirely the two dimensions of the abstract idea of the market. One dimension, remember, is the absolute level of economic decentralization. The number of economic agents who can bargain on their own initiative and for their own account. The other dimension is the absoluteness of the control that each of those agents has over the resources at his disposal. We separate this so that we're willing to relativize the absoluteness of the control in some respects, the better to radicalize the absolute decentralization. And that idea then is embodied in the device of the capital auction. The capital auction is a way of making the property, the control over the means of production temporary and conditional, the better to radicalize decentralized access to the means of production. That shouldn't be the only form of a market order because, as I said, the traditional absolute property right has an advantage. The advantage is it allows the owner, the absolute owner, the perpetual owner, to do something at his own risk and his own discretion that no one else believes in. So in very simple metaphorical and ideological terms, you could say the following. The central idea of the market order in liberal political and economic theory is that the market is a kind of organized anarchy. And because it is an organized anarchy, it is superior, not just practically, but also epistemologically. It is superior to any form of command which presupposes that we know beforehand the best solution for the future. But it turns out on this argument that I've been trying to take you through, that the market order as it exists is not anarchic enough because its idea, its abstract idea of an organized anarchy is in fact pinned down to a particular set of institutional arrangements which radically limit its experimental potential. So in a sense, all of this that I've been describing, the particular proposals about the vanguard and the rearguard, labor and capital, finance and the real economy, have to do with this attempt to liberate the anarchic and experimentalist potential of the market at the cost of superseding, of overcoming, of relaxing, of transforming the particular legal and institutional arrangements with which this organized anarchy has been identified. Now, before I go any further, let me stop there and ask whether any of you would like to make a comment about this idea. You see what the general notion is. It's very important to, to capture the idea. So the liberal economists, the market fundamentalists like Hayek, 
like the classical economist said, the market is superior to planning. It's superior to command, precisely because it's not dogmatic. It recognizes that we don't know the future, that we don't know what's best that our knowledge is fallible and fragmentary and must be corrigible. And therefore, it's, we, can, we have reason to trust the market more than any system of command. But then if we look more closely, we, we see that this form of anarchy is in fact a dogma also. That is, the abstract idea of freedom to recombine, freedom to innovate, is in the end nailed to the cross of a particular version of itself. And the idea is that we should relax the general impulse of experimentalism and anarchy from its particular dogmatic and entrenched institutional forms. Yes. And, and going further, the experimentalism should also be about the institutional framework of experimentation. The experimentalism should be about itself and not about just its particular outcomes under a certain way of conceiving how it's organized. And that includes, for example, let's say it's a capital auction where a kind of way that things were running this market order, that would also be sort of uh, subject of course, and subject, and subject in two ways, because in that particular way of imagining the capital auction, uh, the idea is that the different funds, the different auctioneers, conduct their auction under different designs, different time horizons, different risk profiles, different intended customer bases, and so forth. But there's another idea, which this proliferation of different varieties of the capital auction takes place under the watch of the democratic institutions. And they then observe what works and what doesn't work and confer different values on it. So there is also then a political competition superimposed on the economic competition, as it were, a second dimension. There is no predefined measure. There's no constant measure, because what should be the measure is part of the debate at that higher level, at, the, at that political level. Then let's say, what might be the, uh, in this sort of constant debate and selection process of some of the different things that are being experimented with, is the vision that you know, what works is just whatever is, let's say, I mean, what, what works, there's, there, there's a trivial and tangible sense of what works, which how productive is it? How do you get the best rate of return for the use of certain productive resources? But then at the higher level, which is the level that is pertinent in politics, the question of what works is much more open-ended because what works at what cost? at an environmental cost, at a social cost, at the cost of some form of human degradation that we can't predefine, that we can't anticipate. All of this becomes relevant. And so it seems to me that the idea here is that we can try to conceive the institutions in such a way that it is deliberately impossible to answer your question. That is, if everything is in flux, what is the constant element? And the idea is there is no constant element. Now, this has a certain symmetry to, the, uh, to a debate in cosmology or in fundamental physics, which is, uh, is it coherent 
as a proposition in natural science to say that the laws, constants, and symmetries of nature themselves change. So this, this goes to the question of time. Is there something outside of time? In the tradition of Greek philosophy, of the Greek philosophy of being, which is presupposed up to and through the 20th century physics, relativity and quantum mechanics, not everything in the world changes. Supposedly, the laws, symmetries, and constants of nature do not change. And then some philosophers of science, like Poincaré, said, if everything changed, we couldn't explain anything. So there must be something that doesn't change. But that seems not to be true, because all that's required is that not everything change at the same time or in the same way. And that's the world we have, in which it seems that everything does change. That is, that there's nothing outside of time. Everything changes sooner or later, including or especially the way in which things change. The way in which things change changes. Does that mean that the world is inexplicable? Yes. A widely out constitutional requirements like we did a couple classes ago for like a higher democracy, et cetera, et cetera. Are those in fact requirements or are those just They're not universal or eternal requirements. They're responses to the to our problems today in historical experience. They emerge out of a situation as in the in all the economies that we know in historical time up to now, there has been a most advanced practice of production. Uh, and then the question arises of the relation between the most advanced sector and the rest. We're dealing with a version of that question today. Now, uh, certainly our conception of what makes the most advanced sector most advanced changes. And now, in the light of the knowledge economy as the current most advanced practice of production, we could say what makes the most, pra the most advanced practice most advanced <coughs> is that it is the practice closest to the imagination. It is the most mindful practice. That's what makes it most advanced. The other attributes like productivity, efficiency, are all collateral. They're corollaries of this attribute. So that's what we say today. But will it always be so? There's, there's, there's nothing in this uh, theory which says this is the permanent pattern of history. Uh, and that every future economics must be of this kind. So, and I think this is a profound epistemological issue, whether we can have clarity and progress without presupposing something that is somehow outside the ravages of time. And the claim that I'm making implicitly in all of these arguments is no, we don't need to do that. We, we can have a view which, in which time goes all the way down, there's nothing outside of it. Even though that may lead us into a series of apparent paradoxes. I think that if we look at those paradoxes more closely, we'll see that they're not real paradoxes. We haven't discussed this as an issue in the philosophy of nature, the philosophy of science, but it's implicit in these discussions that we're having. And after all, it was already implicit in Marx's uh, project, because Marx's project was rooted in the critique of English political economy. The essence of the critique is that the English political economist claim that the laws of what Marx would come to describe as capitalism were universal laws of the economy. And Marx would say they're not universal laws of the economy, they're only laws of capitalism. And yet Marx himself then, in the Communist Manifesto with Engels, describes what is supposedly a pattern that in a sense is outside time which is the sequence of the modes of production. There's a short list of the regimes of the modes of production, and there are laws. 
according to Marx, that govern the foreordained succession of the modes of production in history. So for him, as for Aristotle and the Greek philosophy of being as the dominant tradition of Western science, there is something outside time. Time does not go all the way down. I'm trying to dispense with that idea in this argument, as you correctly perceive. Whether coherently or not is up for discussion. Yes? and what follows from that. So it's true institutional change, structural change, well, occurs more slowly yeah, so than, than change that has to do with the moves within the framework. But what follows from that? Yes. So, but that doesn't stop structural change from happening, right? It happens nevertheless. Uh, so all of this, and, and your last observation is very interesting because in the practice of structural change, uh, one of the complications is the disparity between biographical time and historical time. So the individuals, including the leaders of the political parties and the social movements, live as we all do in biographical time. These projects of institutional reconstruction don't take place on the time scale of a human life. Uh, and we're all influenced by the desire that it happened in our own time and for us. But that's not how it is. Right? Uh, so, for example, you take the issue of the conversion of declining mass production industry, now like the Rust Belt industries in the United States and the Midwest, into versions of the knowledge economy. And you can imagine a, a debate I have with the leader of a union or a progressive political party in the United States. And I argue to the leader, uh, this is a, a hopeless project. Mass production is not coming back. If you insist on this strategy of yours of simply buying a few more years for it, through restraints on plant closings, on offshoring, on hiring of temporary labor, you're not going to preserve it. You're just going to get some more years for it. Uh, you should have another strategy. You should try to convert your declining industry into a version of the knowledge economy. And in that project, you will have to treat those groups that you previously thought of as your rivals or enemies as your allies. The small business class, the temporary workers, the foreign workers will have to become your allies in this project. So in other words, there are always two ways of defining and defending a group interest or a class interest. There's one way that is structurally conservative and socially exclusive. And there's another way that is socially solidaristic and institutionally transformative. Now, the practical objection that the leader will make to me is he'll say, you want me to weaken my, or jeopardize my connection to my base, to the lead, before I have another base, and I'll end up with no base at all. That's what he says. 
And he says that from his perspective of being in biographical time. And that's an argument that takes place all the time in politics. And we know what the result is. Overwhelmingly, the short-term, institutionally conservative and socially exclusive way wins for precisely that reason. Uh, if it never won, uh, we couldn't understand how transformation takes place in history. And yet it does. Yes. For that reason, do, do we need to, uh, uh, or are moments of structural change going to be fundamentally related to crises, in almost like a Marxian sense, because of this time to Well, ye issue? yes and no. So, so, but that's because of the nature of political organization of democracy, the existing democracy. All the democracies that exist in the world, as I want to say next, at the next step of the discussion, are comparatively low energy and weak democracies. The democracies of the rich North Atlantic countries, for example. They all maintain political society at a relatively low level of mobilization or temperature, if you like, to use that metaphor. They all perpetuate impasse. They all create a kind of opposition between strong central initiative and radical devolution. And in all these ways, they continue to make change depend on crisis. But this change is, is the dependence of change on crisis invariant, or is it a variable? I want to say it's a variable, that political society can be organized to diminish the dependence of change on crisis. Of course, there's a circularity, which is the instauration of the institutional arrangements that diminish the dependence of change on crisis may itself depend on crisis. Uh, that's the circularity, which has to be broken. And how is it broken? One of the ways in which we might say, if we're hopeful, is that the imagination can do the work of crisis without crisis. The task of the imagination is to do the work of crisis without crisis, uh, to anticipate so that we don't need to have an economic collapse or a war to force us into change. The, that, the, the range of institutional organization that's most pertinent to that is political more than economic. Uh, and that's why in a progressive political economy, the reorganization of the market order in turn calls for the reorganization of politics. There is an issue of sequence, what comes first? And, in, and there's the following paradox, which is in general in the world, the tendency of reformers is to say, the reform of politics comes first. The reform of politics is the antecedent condition. It's the mother of all reforms. First you reform politics, then you redirect political economy. I think they're mistaken that no country reforms its politics or reforms its state in order later to decide what to do with the reform politics or the reform state. The reformation of the state and the politics take place only when they need to take place for the country to be able to do something that wants to do. Not a minute before. And so I, I take the opposite position in that debate of what comes first. And I say, first there has to be a struggle over the social and economic direction. And then we discover collectively what changes in our political life we need to make that change in the economic and social direction possible. We don't say, what, what would be a good kind of democracy to have? Like, I want a high energy democracy as if it were good in itself. Later we'll decide what to do with it. No, it's not like that, I think. But that's another argument.
and so flesh out that analogy. Yeah, so every powerful institutional project, to some extent, creates its own base, right? So you take import substituting industrialization in the 20th century um, was a strategy which then helped produce the base of the organized labor force headquartered in the capital intensive sectors of the economy, which were the import substituting industries in the rising developing countries. They were, the base was created by the project. The base did not, was not antecedent. It was a, a byproduct of the project. And that's characteristic of, of these situations. And that's gonna take us then to the question of what's the base of this that I'm discussing. I wanna to come to that later. Uh, at the third moment in today's class, but I can anticipate what the problem is. So now it doesn't seem plausible to say that the base of all of these institutional changes that we're discussing is the industrial proletariat because the organized industrial labor force headquartered in conventional industry or more generally in the capital intensive sectors of the economy is in the contemporary economies a minority, a shrinking minority, which is perceived by the rest of the society and ultimately comes to perceive itself as just one more special interest and not plausibly as the bearer of the universal interest of humanity as Marx wanted it to be. So, what is the base that replaces this industrial proletariat, which was the hero of progressive political economy and leftist theory in the 19th and 20th century? I think it's what I would call the subjective petty bourgeoisie, that in, around the world, in all these countries, in China and India and in Turkey and Brazil and Indonesia, uh, the majority of men and women are poor, so they're not part of an objective petty bourgeoisie of a small business class, but their horizon of aspiration is for a small farm, a little shop, a trade, uh, a technical service for which they can charge a fee, so this is what I call the subjective petty bourgeoisie. The horizon of aspiration is petty bourgeois, even though they are not petty bourgeois. That's the majority of humanity today. So somehow, and now, what, what is their aspiration by default in the absence of some political project? Their horizon of aspiration is petty bourgeois. Uh, they, as I said, their, their default aspiration is to join an idealized petty bourgeoisie. They think of it in these archaic retrograde terms. It's, it's the, the bric-a-brac of traditional petty bourgeois life based on family saving and self-exploitation. It, it, it doesn't lead to, revel it at best gives them if they succeed in their aspiration, it at best gives them a modest, a modest prosperity. But it doesn't pr help produce for their country a growth miracle. It doesn't produce a dynamic of increasing productivity. So it's like a dead end. Now, then there's another element in the equation, and that has to do with the elites. So in most country, the dominant element in the elite are rentiers of some kind or another, financial or otherwise. And for there to be a growth miracle, two things have to happen. There has to form a dissident elite, I would call it a counter elite, with a nationalist and productivist orientation. And it has to seize power. 
And then it has to garner support in the majority of the people for its project, for its developmentalist project. And what is, what is the task that we have today in these societies? The task is to offer that majority of the subjective petty bourgeoisie an alternative to its archaic petty bourgeois dream. That is to say, your idea of achieving a modest prosperity and independence can only be effectively achieved in some other way, in a way which I would call taking the first steps toward an inclusive knowledge economy. Uh, and not just vegetating or returning to this antiquated idea of isolated, retrograde family business. That's the problem. That's how the problem of development is presented in the world now. Uh, and the question we might ask ourselves is, what's the equivalent to this picture that I drew with respect to the large developing countries in the rich North Atlantic countries? I think there is some, some equivalent. That is, the dispossessed working class which in the United States is called the middle class, right? Uh, with uncertain meaning. Uh, doesn't work for big business. Most people are in this situation of the subjective petty bourgeoisie. In the rich North Atlantic country, at least they're not poor, but they're dispossessed. They have no saving. The, uh, the average saving label, la level in the United States is practically zero. They have no, no positive net worth of any kind. Uh, and their orientation is to some kind of independent petty bourgeois work. But that's in the situation in which the asset holding class and its professional servants are in the vanguard and everyone else is condemned to some kind of make work. So they have no alternative. They're the people who then elect the right-wing populists to come into power. So that's, the that's their political drama. But I've anticipated what I wanted to say in the third part of the class. So uh, let me now go to the second step of today's argument, which is politics. Uh, which your questions just now have anticipated. So these institutional arrangements that I've been exploring in the relation of the vanguard to the, to the rest, to the rear guard of labor to capital, and, and I will explore labor to capital and finance to the real economy. are much more likely to take place against the background of what I would call a high energy form of democracy. All the democracies that exist in the world today are flawed, low energy democracies. By the following tests, the, the power, the ability to practice repeated structural reform, like these reforms that we've been discussing and will continue to discuss. The dependence of change on crisis, exactly the question we were talking about just now, and the rule of the living by the dead. So wh what is a high energy democracy? A high energy democracy is a democracy that is able to change itself structurally with frequency all the time. That, is, that doesn't depend on war and ruin as the enabling conditions of transformation, and that therefore overthrows the rule of the living by the dead. That's a high energy democracy. And on what does that depend? It, I, want, I want to say it depends at least on three sets of institutional changes, which I want now briefly to describe. The first set is a rise in the temperature of politics. By the temperature of politics, I mean the level of organized popular engagement in political life. Uh, 
So the premise of conservative statecraft and conservative political science is that there is a choice, an opposition between a politics that is cold and institutional and a politics that is hot and anti or extra institutional. That's the basic premise of conservative political science and conservative statecraft. At the end of the day, you have to choose between Madison and Mussolini. Now, is that true? Uh, I think it's false. Uh, but what, what it turns on is the institutional question of whether there are institutional arrangements that can make politics both institutional and hot. That is, raise, institutionally raise the level of organized popular engagement in political life. The level of what's sometimes called political mobilization. So the conservative political scientists in the United States, like Huntington, preached the doctrine that there was an antinomy, an opposition, a contradiction between institutionalization and mobilization. So there's a fixed quantum of mobilization compatible with institutionalization. I want to say on the contrary, that one of the most important ways in which sets of political institutions differ from each other is in the extent to which they are hospitable to mobilization. And that turns on, on the combination of practical things. So first of all, the rules of voting. You know that in many, society, in many democracies around the world, both rich and poor, the vote is mandatory. In the United States, the vote is optional. In American elections, half of the population votes. Now, what does it mean to say the vote is mandatory? What it means is that you, you're required to vote under the sanction of a small fine. If you vote, when you vote, you have the privilege of abstention. Under rule of mandatory voting, abstention has a very different meaning from the meaning it has under rule of optional voting. Because under rule of optional voting, abstention means everything's OK. You don't care. But if the majority then abstains in the voting booth, that's a condemnation of the political options presented to the society. It has a completely different meaning. Then the rules governing the use of money in politics. So uh, in the United States, you know that the use of private money for political campaigns is regarded as linked to free expression. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, money talks. My former colleague, Paul Freund, said, I thought that was the problem. Uh, but so it's, it's who's, whether you can use money in politics, whether access to the means of mass communication is, uh, paid for, whether you can buy it. In many democracies around the world, you can't buy it. Uh, the free distribution of television time is a condition for the media companies to hold their revocable licenses and so forth. And then the electoral regimes, which are purely circumstantial in their effect. So if the, you have a country like Italy that has a frozen system of political parties, the rejection of proportional representation can have a mobilizing effect. In another society, it's the opposite. Adoption of proportional representation in opposition to first past the post voting can have a mobilizational effect. But so the, the general claim that's made by the conservatives and in political sociology is this is part of culture. But I would say, Give me a rule of mandatory voting. Give me free access to the means of mass communication. Give me a prohibition of the use of private money in politics. 
give me experimentation with electoral regimes, and you'll see that the Americans will become just as politicized as anyone else. And that what is supposedly cultural is in fact an artifact of these institutional arrangements. So the basic idea is that the, the temperature level of politics is a variable. It's susceptible to change. And it is possible to create a politics that is both hot and institutional. Would someone like to comment on that? It's a very important theme in the background of the economic changes. Yes. Well, that's an important issue. So I have the sense, uh, I'm, I'm going to list now a series of changes in the organization of democracy. And my impression is that the American progressives almost universally believe that the priority changes, the first changes, should be the changes that have to do with this theme that we're now discussing, uh, the temperature of politics and especially the use of money in politics. I think my conjecture is, just as a practical matter, and you're more informed about this than I am, that they're mistaken, that this is not the place to begin, that the best place to begin is the reinvention of American federalism, because it cuts across the divisions between right and left. Uh, and it, it has, it's received with, with very well across the country. Uh, the Republican governors in the United States are all experimenting with their little Silicon Valleys and their, their preposterous experiments. They're like uh, Potemkin villages. Uh, they can't work, but, it, but it's a sign that there's life there. Huh? That from the not feasible experiments, they can go to the feasible ones. So I would, uh, that's where I would, that's my intuition of where best to begin and answer your question. Huh? Now, yes? Uh, I've been thinking about the concept of high energy, so high energy democracy, um, which changes by structural and frequency and structural change, that's right, makes yeah. it more feasible, less dependent on crisis. Well, this is a general point, right? This is, this is a general point because I think that this talk of structural change, because of its associations in the history of politics and political thought, is, a, is thought of as traumatic and confusion, anarchy, conflict, and so forth. Um, but I have a different idea. So let's present it in an abstract form. Uh, going back to a contrast I made in an earlier class, you can contrast two sets of moves. The ordinary moves that we make within a framework of arrangements and assumptions we take for granted, and the extraordinary moves by which from time to time we challenge and change pieces of the framework. And then we, we start out with the idea that these are two completely different things. Now, the project that is being described is the project of relativizing the distinction between these two categories of moves. So that the moves by which we challenge and change pieces of the framework grow more continuously and naturally out of the ordinary moves that we make within the framework. So what you call the normal business of life. And in the course of the normal business of life, we have more opportunities to tinker with pieces of the framework. Now, does that mean permanent war? No, I don't think so. I think that's a change in, the, in, in our definition of constancy, uh, in which we come to think that this 
endless tinkering, this experimentalism, is the banal form of transformation. So it's, and it did therefore have the metaphor. So you have a building that's rigid, and, and then there's a wind or an earthquake or something. So it either falls or it doesn't fall, right? But if it's built to be flexible in the wind or on the earthquake, does that mean that it's unstable? It means it's more stable. Uh, so I think it's a difference in the experience and the conception of stability rather than the subordination of stability to something else. But that's the kind of problem that, that, it, that it poses. You want to continue? Sure. So let me try another abstract idea also uh, that reveals the psychological problem or the psychological content. Imagine a spectrum of societies. At one pole of the spectrum is an idealized caste order, right, in which your membership in one of these scriptural castes determines everything you can do, what you can do, what you can't do, how you can talk, how you can live, so that any change in the order is a threat to your identity, to your security. Now, what's the opposite of that on this imaginary spectrum? The opposite of that is a situation in which as much as possible, your sense of identity and security is detached from the rigidification of social life. And so this Scandinavian or Dutch idea of flex security is a little thing going in that direction. You make the safeguards of the worker portable by detaching them from the tenure of the job. They, they go with him. Huh? Uh, now, where do we fit in this spectrum? What I say is we don't we would like to think we fit on that other side, but we don't fit on that other side. We're in some place intermediate because uh, we have these arrangements that do make our sense of security and identity, our interests, depend on the preservation of a form of life to which we're accustomed. So we're not as emancipated as we think we are. And as I would want to say, as we have reason to become. Uh, but what we would want in principle would be to move further along that spectrum. And it's not the spectrum in which we're plunged into anarchy, into doubt. It's a spectrum in which, along which our fundamental security, our sense of identity, our vital interests become more compatible with experimentation with the surrounding and there's the following interesting twist in our situation, which I think people don't properly appreciate. The 19th century idea of liberal rights was that the preservation of this classic system of rights was part of our identity and of our freedom that was intrinsic to it. I think we now have a skeptical and negative idea, which is, not, it's not the 19th century idea that the preservation of the classic right of property and contract is part of our freedom and security. Our idea is a negative idea that all of the alternatives would endanger our identity and security. And that's actually a subtle but profound change in our political conceptions. Uh, because then it ra it's an empirical question. Would they in fact endanger it? Depends on what they are and how they work. But it's already a movement in the direction of detaching our conception of our basic interests and our identity from the preservation of this structure. Right? 
I th and, and that's that's the issue that that, that it arouses. So I say the 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 attempt to, to go in the direction of a high energy democracy begins in this attempt to raise the temperature. Uh, and all of the elements in that that I described are they're trivial. They're they're not some radical changes. They're they're made up of things that are happening all around us in the contemporary world. Uh, the second set of innovations has to do with the pace of politics. So a high energy democracy is rapid politics. Uh, by analogy to Popper's principle in the philosophy of science, Popper said the point in science is to make mistakes as quickly as possible. So you could say similarly in politics, the point is to make mistakes as quickly as possible. The point is not to avoid mistakes. And let's take the American constitutional arrangements as the clearest example of this argument about the pace of politics. So in the American constitutional arrangements, as designed by Madison and his peers, there are two architectural principles. There is a liberal principle of the fragmentation of power in the state. There are many sources and seats of power. And that fragmentation is part of the scheme of constitutional freedom. And there is a conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. That's the essence of Madison's particular version of checks and balances. So the import of the conservative principle is to create a kind of table of correspondences between the transformative reach of a political project and the severity of the constitutional obstacles that it has to overcome in order to be realized. So the more transformative it is, the more, the greater the obstacles. That's different from the fragmentation of power. Now, the Americans, who after all revere their constitution, it was the cult of the constitution in the United States. It wasn't always the cult of the constitution. One of the drafters and founders, Jefferson, for example, believed that every two and a half generations, the constitution should be trashed. Uh, precisely because he explicitly said he didn't want the dead to rule the living. Uh, he wanted the Constitution to be the product of people who were alive at that time. But no one paid attention to this idea of that founder, uh, despite the reverence in which he's held. So, now, the Americans all think that this liberal principle of the fragmentation of power is naturally and necessarily associated with the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. That they're two sides of the same thing. But they're not two sides of the same thing. They're completely different. And it's easy to imagine any number of constitutional devices that would reaffirm the liberal principle but repudiate the conservative one. For example, you could say that under an American-style presidential regime, whenever there is a stalemate between the two political branches, the president and the Congress, either branch would unilaterally have the right, the constitutional prerogative, of calling early elections, which, however, would always have to be bilateral for both branches. So the power that exercised the constitutional prerogative of calling the early elections to dissolve the impasse would have to pay the political price of running the electoral risk. I think that you might think that then elections would be called too often. To me, it seems that the more plausible danger is that it would be called too rarely. 
because of the reluctance of the elected politicians to face another election out of time, an early election. But by this simple device, you would turn the logic of the presidential system on its head and make it a device for the acceleration of politics. So, and this illustrates another point about institutional design, that in the realm of institutional design, small changes can have drastic consequences. Because after all, this change that I'm describing is a small change. And if you compare this to the Constitution of the French Fifth Republic, the French say they, they have two constitutional times under their system. A fast time, when the parliamentary majority coincides with the president, and a slow time when the, the parliamentary majority diverges from the president. So this is like the constitution of the French Fifth Republic with no slow time. It only has a fast time because under these ideas, fast is good and slow is bad. Uh, and so we, just, we, we say we'll accelerate politics. No question or comment. So high temperature politics and accelerated politics. And now we come to a third set of institutional innovations that have to do with the relation between central power and local power, devolution. The premise of, cons so now comes the third premise of conservative political science and statecraft. The first is politics has to be either cold and institutional or hot and anti-institutional. The second is the, the liberal principle of fragmentation of power is inseparable from the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. And the third is there's a hydraulic uh, and antithetical relation between central power and local power. Either power flows to the center or power flows to the periphery. And I say that again, that's not true. That depending on the details, the, the detailed way in which we shape the combination of divided and concurrent powers under the Constitution, we can have more of both. Uh, and what's the objective? The objective is the following. That we want society to be able to make strong options and go down a certain road that it chooses. We don't want politics to be an endless cycling of each party's second best solutions. We want to try out their best solutions, what they want. It goes down a certain road. But as it goes down a certain road, society hedges its bets and allows part of itself to deviate from the predominant solution and to generate a counter model of the national future. That's the basic idea. Uh, and you can imagine that, so this is the experimentalist idea of federalism, which is supposedly part of the initial idea of federalism, the laboratories of experimentation and so forth. But the, the conventional conception of federalism, which was rigid allocation of powers between the center and the periphery, is anti-experimentalist and betrays this supposed ideal. So how, what would be the institutional evolution of this experimentalist idea of federalism? You can imagine it has two stages. In the first stage, the emphasis is on cooperation cooperative federalism. And cooperation can be vertical uh, within the federation or horizontal among the states and among the municipalities. Cooperative federalism is the best device of experimentalism at the first stage. Now, for example, take the issue of school finance in a country that is large, unequal, and federal and structural, like the United States, or like my country, Brazil, or like India. Uh, you say, the principle has to be the co 
there have to be national standards of investment in quality, coexisting with the local management of the schools by the, by the states and municipalities. How can you reconcile national standards with local management? You need three instruments. You need a set of tests to show what works, school by school and student by student. You need a redistributive mechanism to redistribute resources and staff from richer places to poor places. So, so you, you can't allow the only base of school finance to be local finance, the property tax in the United States. There has to be a transfederal mechanism. And third, you need a corrective mechanism. So if a local school system persistently falls beneath the minimum acceptable threshold of quality and investment, there has to be in the federation a mechanism to take it over, not by federal intervention, but by collaboration, a cooperative collaboration of the three levels of the federation in collegiate bodies, to take it over, assign it to independent experts, fix it, and return it fixed, like a, a business in a Chapter 11 bankruptcy being restructured. Uh, so that's the, let's say that's the first stage of experimentalism in, in, uh, in federalism. The second stage is what I would call wide divergence. So here's the problem. In a federal system, in principle, there's the presumption that all the states have to enjoy at the same time the same level of right of divergence, right? So if, if one state can diverge from federal law, all the states have to enjoy simultaneously the same level of the right of divergence. But if you impose this restraint, the right of divergence will necessarily be very limited. So the alternative would be to say a, a, part, a part of the society can apply exceptionally for a right of wide divergence to do something different, very different from what's done in other parts of the country. And of course, this has to be vetted by the political branches and by the judiciary to prevent abuse because in the United States there's a, uh, a formidable history of oppression that arises from states' rights. So that has to be prevented by, by these constitutional precautions. Uh, but if the prerogative of wide divergence is vetted politically and judicially, then a part of the society can have a right of diverging very radically from the predominant solutions. And that's in the interest of everyone on this argument of experimentalism. Uh, now here, and this points out a paradox. It is almost universally supposed that a federation is better for experimentalism than a unitary state, like the United Kingdom or France. But this thought shows the opposite is true, because in a federation, there's the presumption of simultaneous divergence. In a unitary state, it is much easier to imagine a special deal. So for example, the government of the United States can make, of the United Kingdom, can make a deal with Scotland that is different from the deal that it makes with Wales, or for that matter, with England. Uh, and that's more readily possible in a unitary state. And so a unitary state can also have this combination of strong central initiative and radical divergence. Uh, so those are the three innovations. Uh, there are others that I would I, I just point to two others that I would add to these three. One is developing a power in the state, you could call it in the United States, a fourth branch, 
to do a form of structural innovation or change that is localized but structural. Huh? So this is what the judges did, the federal judges did in the United States under the label of structural injunctions or complex enforcement in a certain period with relatively marginal social institutions like school systems, insane asylums, mental hospitals, or prison systems. If there was a part of, of an area of social practice or an organization they're seen as contradicting an ideal, typically an anti-subjugation ideal imputed to the law, then the judges would intervene in that area and reconstruct it. They would invade the causal background of a particular part of social life and fix it. Now, uh, in the conventional organi constitutional organization of the state, the government, there's no branch of government that's ideally suited for that. Because after all, the legislature is to deal with general rules, the administrative agencies are to enforce them, the president is to execute them. No one is equipped and legitimated and resourced to do a form of intervention that is structural but localized. But in these societies, which are class societies, there will be groups that are caught in a circumstance of exclusion or disadvantage from which they are unable to escape by the forms of collective political and economic action that are available to them. And therefore, there should be in the state a power that is designed, equipped, resourced and legitimated to come to their rescue and release them from their circumstance of disadvantage. And that would be the idea of the fourth set of innovations. And the fifth set of innovations is without annulling the institutions of representative democracy to gradually superimpose on them another level of representative or de direct democracy. So direct or participatory democracy not as the opposite of representative democracy, but as its, as its enrichment. Now, so I've given five sets of institutional innovations, and the argument I'm making is just that. That it's nothing mysterious or vague or theoretical. I'm saying we want a high energy democracy to replace the low energy democracies that we have. This is the way to do it. And the, low, the high energy democracies are the ideal political background to these structural changes in political economy. And we don't, the normal way in which we would generate them is not by thinking that they're good in themselves and we'll decide later what to do with them because we, 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 have, we want to take a certain economic direction and then we need to change the politics as a condition for the, for the, for the economic change of direction. Comments? So, yes. Can you please elaborate a bit more on uh, what you talked about the imposition of a direct form of democracy over representative form of democracy? Yeah, direct democracy is without, without an intermediate level of representatives, right? So we could have it. The different ways in which you can add to representative institutions a direct, uh, or rep a, a direct element, a participatory element. You can do it at the bottom, for example, through local participation, neighborhood associations parallel to <coughs> municipal government, or participatory budgeting and so forth from the bottom up. And you can do it from the top down through national programmatic plebiscites. 
So that would be an alternative to the early elections. You say there's a stalemate. Not, it's not single issue plebiscites or referenda. It's the plebiscite about a choice of direction for the country and the country's calls to participate. That's also direct democracy because the decision is taken by all and not through representatives. So that's, <clears throat> in the history of the West, uh, it's remarkable how narrow the repertoire of constitutional arrangements is. Uh, a very tiny fraction of changes. And in the 20th century constitutions, aside from corporatism in the fascist period, the main innovation was to fill the constitutions with promises of rights. So that's what the 20th century constitutions are. Like the Indian constitution, the Brazilian constitution, they promise everything. Education, health, happiness, everything you can imagine is promised in the constitution with absolutely no institutional machinery to realize it's a complete flop. Huh? So uh, I'm saying, that's not the way to go. The way to go is seriously to imagine reorganizing the institutional mechanics of democracy so it can produce results uh, and not these unkept promises that ever since the Weimar Constitution, the 20th century constitutions have been filled with. In the United States, they don't do it by changing constitutions. They do it by reinterpreting the Constitution, right? Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte advised that a Constitution should be brief and obscure, but it seems that the only people who decided to follow his advice were the Americans. Yes? So I would say this is a way of so this is a way of conceiving democracy, constitutional democracy, as an ongoing experiment with the forms of a free society uh, to make it fertile in the production of the new. And so you say democracy is not just the government of the majority qualified by the rights of the minority. Democracy is a system for the perpetual creation of the new. And that's this experimentalist idea, which is embodied in these institutional arrangements. And I think as a, uh, it's associated with a conception of who we are and who we want to become. So to say, we, what is important about the human being is that in our existence, everything in our existence points beyond itself. Huh? And so our economic life and our political life has to be an expression of this transcendence. Huh? We are, we're formed by context, by our <coughs> form of social life we inhabit. Uh, the social and conceptual worlds that we build and move in, but there's always more in us than there is in them. Uh, uh, we spill over, uh, and this is the essential human attribute of transcendence and the dialectic of our transcendence with our finitude. So what form of political life is appropriate for such a being is the philosophical basis. And it's also embodied in a view of the imagination. So we have the same experience of transcendence in our mental life. The imagination, the two moves of the imagination are first distancing from the phenomenon. That was what Kant emphasized. 
but second, the subsumption of the actual under a range of accessible possibles. That's the imagination. Uh, uh, because we don't understand anything if we don't understand what it can next become. That's what it means to understand something. So that's transcendent in our mental life and not just in our practical life. And so all of these ideas are ideas about how such a being can find a place for itself in the world, can make a world which does justice to who we are or who we can become, who we have reason to become. Um, respecting this attribute of transcendence. So of course the premise is we are we're homeless in the world. There's no definitive home for us, right? Uh, so all these doctrines in the past, including classical liberalism, dogmatic liberalism, say this is our home. This classic system of liberal rights, the classic freedom of contract, the absolute property right. And then we discover all the bad consequences. No? So we don't come and say that, no, they were wrong, but there's another dogma to replace that dogma. We say what we want are institutional arrangements that count among their most important attributes that they facilitate their own correction. We don't think they're neutral because there are no neutral institutional frameworks but we do think that they have the next best thing, which is they're open to a wide range of contradictory experience and they're corrigible. They don't entrap us. So as we begin to discover their hidden flaws and consequences, we can correct them. We're not, we're not imprisoned in them. Uh, and all of our economic and political arrangements must share this quality of not entrapping us, of allowing us to be open to a wide range of contradictory experience and inviting us to correct them. And that, that, that I would want to say is true of both the economic alternatives and the political alternatives that I've been discussing. Yeah. Well, I think so. So take the so take the idea of a of this vital core protections, right? I think there are two there are two problems. Um, so the first is the desire that we have to say that they're sacrosanct. And immutable, and that, and and liter understood literally, that's a fiction. It's not true. There's nothing immutable. Uh, so we can try and make them sacrosanct. We can entrench them in the Constitution, and make their change susceptible to a supermajority, and we can surround them with an aura of sanctity, which dissuades us from meddling. But the truth is that there's nothing that we can't meddle with. Anything can change if the fire is sufficiently high, right? Uh, so that's a fiction. But the idea behind the fiction is that we take something out of the agenda of short-term politics in order to enrich the agenda of short-term politics. That's the essential dialectical move, right? So you take something out because it, it empowers us in the hope that that will expand, expand the agency. But it's always susceptible to correction. So the idea that we can't change it 
is literally not true. Uh, we can change it. The, the Americans did it by, they revised their constitution by pretending it means something else. So they reinterpret equal protection or due process or whatever. That's how they do it. But no one can f have this definitive solution. Now, then the other question is, why do we do this? Uh, why do we guarantee this haven? We guarantee this haven so that something can happen outside of the world. Uh, so that's why I said, it's like the parent says to the child, I love you. You have an unconditional place in my love. Now, go out and raise a storm in the world. That's why you say that to the child. You don't say to the child, I'll protect you. You have an unconditional place, and that's the end of the story. That's the beginning of the story. And this is, I think, the great defect of social democracy, which it only has the part about the haven. It doesn't have the part about the storm. So we say, I'll protect you, now go out and raise a storm. The storm doesn't happen spontaneously. The storm has to be arranged. Uh, and, and that's all this discussion about the institutional alternative. So I think the, the alternative that emerges from this discussion is quite different from the conventional discourse of human rights. Uh, the conventional discourse of human rights is, you know, history is a nightmare, the world is terrible, we need to have this sacred space that no one can defy. But we can't have it in that, in literally in that form. And the best way to have it, to protect it, is all that other stuff. I mean, we can have this space. But what are we going to do with the world? How are we going to fix the world? How are we going to transform it? Uh, it's that activity of active agency, of restructuring and reshaping, which is the best security of freedom. It's funny because I think that this way of thinking is uh, its a way that should be congenial to Americans. Pragmatic, it's open. Yes. And is this like Paul Warren for the Occupy here on the margins and not the big transformations that we need? But I'm curious to get your thoughts around some of the more popular, maybe talked about Tory proxy tactics as of late. Specifically, there's. After the war is about what? Like what? There's been this big flurry of activity and energy around citizen assemblies. I think uh -huh. particularly coming out of the citizen assembly in France around climate in 2019, 2020. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious for your reaction on sort of that. Well, I think so, you know, in, in, so in the history of political thought, there are two main oppositions. Uh, first, philosophically, uh, the most influential opposition in the history of political thought is the opposition of what Benjamin Constant's Franco-Swiss theorist of the early 19th century said was the, the freedom of the ancients and the freedom of the modern. So by the ancients, he meant a mythical idea of ancient Sparta or ancient Rome. So for them, freedom was a life in which the experience of citizenship was central. Politics was central and permeated everything. It's like our idea of religion, which should permeate everything. Uh, and the freedom of the moderns was the real flesh and bones individual for whom his attention is riveted on his own interests his concern. And politics is an ecstatic activity, exceptional activity. So that, in that contrast, the position implied in these arguments is 100% the freedom of the moderns. Not because it's 
the point of arrival, but because it's the point of departure. That's what we have to start from. So it's this real individual who's narrow, who's self-interested, who's narcissistic, who's concerned with himself and his family and those proximate to him. And somehow, the scope of that interest has to be broadened, little by little. We have to start from that real person and make him bigger. Huh? Now, then there's the second, the second circle of debate which is about the institution. And there, as I say, the, the axis of constitutional evolution is extraordinarily narrow. Uh, the kinds of the ways of organizing democratic states are like two or three options, a tiny number of combinations. Uh, then these innovations in the 20th century that were mainly flops, and the main alternative offered by the leftists was direct democracy. So it was the idea of base, forgetting about representative institutions and basing democracy on the council, popular council, the Soviets. That's what the Soviets were. Uh, to replace representative democracy. Now, I have the same position in the second debate that I have on the first debate. That is, the, the idea of basing democracy, political life on direct democracy, was a feint, a flop. Uh, and everywhere it was tried out, in a way that was more than symbolic, it was a passing interlude that came before the imposition of a dictatorship by a, a group, a political group, cl claiming to speak in the name of the nation. Uh, and I haven't changed my position in these contemporary debates. So I, I think if they're not, if they're real, if they're intended for real, you, they're not serious. Uh, so we have to start from the representative institutions, but add to them this other dimension and not as it were, wish them away by some kind of festival of collective experimentation. It's the same, it's the same position. So we start from the real thing, the real thing is unacceptably narrow, and then we try to broaden it. It's the same strategy with respect to the second debate as with respect to the first debate. Now, I did want to return, at least briefly at the end, to this question of the constituency. We had a discussion in an earlier class about compensatory redistribution. And I just want to remind you of the consequences. So for the most part, progressives today wouldn't be talking about any of these things that I've been talking about, these institutional changes in the market order. They would talk about the attenuation of inequality. And on that debate about inequality, I remind you of the three principles for which I argued in an earlier class. The first principle is that with respect to equality and inclusion, what matters overwhelmingly is the primary distribution of advantage and opportunity, economic and educational, and not the secondary distribution, the distribution that emerges from corrective and retrospective redistribution. That's what matters most. Corrective redistribution can be used to achieve particular aims, such as developing the capabilities of the population in health and education. And it can be used to extend the work of primary distribution, but it can't be used as a substitute. We can't organize an economy that makes people radically unequal and deepens the abyss between the vanguard and everything else and hope that we can fix it later by redistribution. That doesn't work because then we, 
say, we have the economy, the economy is the machine for creating wealth, then we'll take it all back. We can't take it all back without destroying the, the basis of economic life. The second principle then is that going down the hierarchy of principles, we come to the, the budget on both the revenue raising side and the spending side. That's the source of corrective reason, the secondary reason. Now with respect to that, I say, what matters in the short term is the aggregate level of the tax take and how it is spent. What matters most is not the progressive profile of the tax system on the revenue raising side. And if we have a tax that is neutral with respect to relative prices, as the comprehensive flat rate value added tax is, it will allow us to maximize the tax take and then to spend it redistributively, which is why the, the budgets of the European social democracies are much more redistributive than their American counterparts. Even though on paper, the American system is much more progressive because it gives pride of place to the progressive taxation of personal income. Then we come to the third principle. If we are really determined and sincere in our profession of redistributive faith, we can use a direct redistributive tax to complete the work initiated by the transformation of the structure. And there are two targets of redistributive taxation the accumulation of economic power, and the hierarchy of standards of living. The hierarchy, the, ex the accumulation of economic power is a target very hard to reach by taxation it, because it depends on the totality of the arrangements of the economy. The best way to reach it is at death through a confiscatory tax on inheritance. The hierarchy of standards of living we can reach through direct, a direct redistributive tax. And the best way to reach it is an individualized tax on consumption, the Caldor tax. Taxing on a steeply progressive slope, the difference between aggregate labor and capital income and invested savings, with 100% not being the limit, because the limit can be anything then it simply depends on political will and political power. That was the argument I had. Now, that leaves open the remaining question, which is the constituency, the base for these projects that I'm defining. And that's the point that I raised about the, what I call the subjective petty bourgeoisie. That's the majority of humanity. They're not the proletariat, the industrial proletariat. They're these people who would like to be shopkeepers and little farmers and so forth. It's going to get them nowhere. I mean, it'll eke out an existence, but, and for the societies, it's a complete dead end. So how are we going to change this? That's the practical problem we have now in the world. Uh, and for that, we need to have ambitious programmatic ideas. We need to have a fracture in the elites, in the national elites. There has to be a counter elite. The counter elite has to have a nationalist and productivist orientation. It has to garner support in this subjective petty bourgeois majority and offer it an alternative to its default option of antiquated, regressive, isolated family business. And it's in that context that the discussion about a more inclusive knowledge economy would have to take place. Now, what do you think of all of that? 
that's the that's the the nub of the practical question. Yes. Um, the second point is that you, if I'm understanding it correctly, is that budget must be redistributive, right? The what? The budget budget must be redistributive because you are uh, focusing on spending more uh, on your credit card than the credit No, account. I don't think myself. And this is an important clarification, which I've been trying to make. I don't think that the essence is equality. I regard myself as a leftist, but I don't think that the left is about equality. That's the modern view, that the left is equality. But of course, their equality is an equality that they combine with agnosticism or skepticism about institutions, about structure. So what it really means is defense of this compensatory redistribution by tax and transfer. It's a justification for this littleness. Uh, I think that if we're thinking big, the left or the progressives are not about equality. They're about freedom. They're about agency. They're the enhancement of the capability of action of the ordinary man and woman. The bringing of the life of the ordinary man and woman to a higher level a bigger life, huh? and the thesis, the thesis of the progressives is that everyone can come to a higher life, that it's not natural and not necessary for human life to be small, and that we can all ascend, provided that we ascend together. That's the first thesis. And the second thesis is that this ascent together depends on change of the structure. Not the way that Marx and the Marxists used to think about it, as systemic change, substitution of one regime by another, but piecemeal, fragmentary, but potentially radical change of the structure, piece by piece, step by step, part by part. Uh, and now in this context of this problem that I just raised about what the new base is, the new base is this group, which if we think now in the terms of Western history, of European history of the 20th century, there couldn't be a more implausible base, right? Because after all, the petty bourgeoisie was demonized by the left in the 20th century, and it became the crucial base of the Nazi and fascist regimes it was the enemy. Uh, but now it turns out that the enemy, as the leftists imagine them, is now the majority of humanity. So what are we going to do about that? Uh, we have to rethink all of this. So I mean, the, we have this in Brazil now. Uh, we have 80 million evangelicals. Uh, explicitly uh, when they're not petty bourgeois, there would be petty bourgeois. Look at Modi's India, it's the same business. Uh, this is now the situation of the world. And so I think that it's a hopeful situation, but I'm by nature very hopeful. So I see hope even though no one else sees it. <laughs> but, but I, uh, but it, it requires a, a, a complete reimagination of the of the circumstance. Yes. Why, why do you think we haven't reached this counter elite that we live today? We just have this fascinating this uh, left Sherman in the Counter elite doesn't exist. In, in the way that you described it. In yeah, I don't know. Sure. When you see, I don't know how this category would apply in the United States. I'm not certain because. Say. So the elite, the entrepreneurial elite in the United States is not Rontiers. The, the, uh, entrepreneur, the asset holding class in Brazil, in my country, and most other countries in the world is Rant are Rontiers, uh, and specifically financial Rontiers. Uh, but in the United States, who are they? So. Uh, they're entrepreneurs who have made it become rich. Uh, 
they're surrounded by this host of, of paper pushers of servers uh, who graduate from places like Harvard University and, and the bankers and financiers and estate planners and tax preparers and so forth. Everyone else, as I say, is in some kind of make work. But are they rentiers? No, I think they're, they're, they're self-interested. Some of them think of themselves as progressive. They look around the country and say, why, why isn't the rest of the country like us? Why isn't there an, uh, a knowledge economy in North Dakota? Uh, and then the governor of North Dakota will say, well, we'll have one. We'll make a little Potemkin village of a little Silicon Valley. So it's, there's, so it's, it's different, right? It's, it's not the same situation, but it would be necessary for, the, for there to be, a, a, nevertheless, a change, some kind of movement at the elite level as part of this elite to be, to assume a national productivist project for the country and to fight for it. Otherwise, how is it going to arise? Uh, and, uh, but I think they, so you, 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 you can inform me better about this. I'm sure you know more about this than I do, but how did, how did this, how does the national alternative emerge in the United States? What's the answer? Okay, well we can do after the spring break, but I think we're at the we're at the. This is this is much more than just an academic discussion.